And we are back, ladies and gentlemen. It is again time to deal with regulations, luckily. And <laughs> what is the what is the first topic that we are dealing with right now? Exceptions. Oh, I see. Today I challenge your um, imagination, creativity. So please, please just imagine it as here. Exceptions for investments in other open-ended UCIs. So, may I ask, what again is an open-ended UCI? Well, because this is not a live um, lecture or something, nobody answers me, but I will answer myself. An open-ended UCI is not a closed-ended UCI. Thereby, it is not explained. But oh, we can start the other way around. We can say a closed-ended UCI is actually a UCI which has not a fixed amount of um, shares. And in case, for example, this is an index replicating UCI as well, then they can be traded on an exchange. Yeah, <laughs> well, that is a closed-ended UCI. And so, meaning, what is then an open-ended UCI? An open-ended UCI is the opposite. It means it has fixed shares. Why it has fixed shares? Therefore, that the investor, in case the investor wants to <coughs> um, buy in, it can purchase shares, and in case he wants to sell out, he or she or it, the investor, um, wants to sell out, it can redeem shares. Well, maybe also I should uh, update the, the slide, because it is actually stated here, well, that just up front. And also, maybe worth mentioning is that in the last part, we were dealing with usage. And now we are dealing with UCIs. Of course, we all know already about the difference. And the difference, I just will mention it to, for, for, for reason of continuity, for reasons of continuity, of course. And now I, I forgot uh, the, the red line. I forgot my sentence. Ah, yeah, the difference is usage. <laughs> Are a regulatory framework actually. Why? I mean, also that is known, of course. That is because this is an EU <coughs> um, yeah, framework, and thereby it comes with a lot of regulations, but also with a lot of benefits in terms of many things, for example, investor protection and many other things. Well, a UCI, so a usage is always a UCI because UCIs are actually pooling investments, making them accessible for investors. But UCIs can be, for example, hedge funds. I use its count because it is limited due to the regulations. Actually, oftentimes UCITs are mutual funds, for example. Um, well, <laughs> I think that's it about the difference between UCIs and UCITs. So let us have a look at the. Uh, <clears throat> I forgot that I put a, a, a line there. I have to drink something. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, all right. Let's actually start talking about the exceptions uh, for other open ended UCIs. We see three bullet points. That means actually there are three exceptions. And the nice thing about the first one is it is very simple and I don't have to talk much about it. And it states 20% is the investment maximum in single usage or other UCIs. Yeah, and as I said, I don't have to say much about it uh, because that is nothing um, that is worth explaining. It's quite self explaining it even doesn't need an explanation in my from my angle okay so let's continue with the <coughs> second 
part, uh, with the second uh, exception, excuse me. The second exception says 30% of net assets maximum invested in other UCIs. Okay, is also quite um, self-explaining, but it is stated there that it is not applicable for usage. And, of course, we know why. And, well, I will <clears throat> again just recap it. This we know already because of Article 43.3, which states that in case, how was it, in case it is an EU issued or backed um, investment, it can be exceeding, I mean, it may not exceed 35%, so meaning can be up to 35% which is 5% more than 30%. And actually also because um, there is this 100% <coughs> excuse me, um, exception for T-bills, <coughs> for example, um, when they are in, in six issues, in, in six issues, when they are, yeah, Held, I mean, uh, issue, uh, issued by the government, like T bills or T notes, and here it is also in text form. All right. Uh, of course, uh, also, um, also, I forgot to mention that that is an, an EU, EU issued uh, transferable securities or MMIs. Nothing else. All right. So this is also clear. Let's continue with the third one. The third one was quite a, a journey for me because it is actually dealing with the charging of additional fees in case we do have linked UCIs. What are linked UCIs? Well, linked UCIs are UCIs which are linked by the management company. So actually, here's a UCI, here's another UCI, and here's a management company, and they are both at the same management company, for example, BlackRock. So if UCI number one and UCI number two want to invest in each other while they are both um, managed by BlackRock, for example, then <clears throat> it is forbidden to charge additional fees. Of course, uh, that's a very sad situation for the management company as well. And, well, I was reading that in the reference book, and I was thinking, where is that coming from? I mean, I don't assume that EY is putting fake news in its book, but I wanted to just have a look into it. And I did, of course, also to provide you with the best possible information. And it brought me into some regulations. The first one I found was the directive stated here, EU Directive 2009-65-EC. And I think I have it here on the paper. There is stated, if someone wants to look it up, it is stated in Act 30. Act 30. Unit holders of both the merging and the receiving uses should also be able to request the repurchase or redemption of their units or, where possible, to convert them into units in another usage with a similar investment policies, uh, with similar investment policies, and managed by the same management company, their first first point, uh, or by a linked company. So actually, this means it must not only mean that it is the same management company, but can also be a linked management company like, for example, BlackRock has many BlackRock companies. Um, well, but just besides, that right should not be subject to any additional charge, save for fees to be retained exclusively by the respective usage to cover disinvestment costs in all situations as set out in the prospectuses of the merging and the receiving usage. All right, at least something. But the context is merging. So it was not actually what I was looking for, but at least it was actually stating 
I mean, like repeating what was standing there, but only applicable for mergers. So I was having a closer look to the CSSF circular 18 slash 698. And this one, well, I won't read it now to you because this is not a, I don't know, a reading course. And uh, this goes, this like links you back to the MIFID 2 regulation. And there you find it in the paragraph 74. I think it was, but actually also there, it was not like coherently expressing the same as stated here. But since there are like many thousands of CSSF circulars, I did not came um, to it reading them all, but uh, I'm on it. Uh, so I couldn't find the explicit coherent expression, but I'm quite sure and in trust that EY is just correct. <clears throat> well, because also, I mean, it's mentioned in the directive, um, like really closely, just in terms of mergers. <laughs> well, so, but it was a journey. And also, there's another condition for this charging of additional fees. <clears throat> I mean, you don't have to care about that if uh, you are not someone <clears throat> creating fees in an administrative manner. But if you do, then it's good to know that in case you're your managed, your your fund that you're managing or that you administer is uh, investing in a linked UCI more than 50%, then you actually are allowed to charge fees, which of course is, uh, well, it, it is how it is. And actually this was stated as <clears throat> substantial proportion I think if you want to um, use these terms then you can say if a substantial proportion is um, invested in another linked UCI then the, this must be disclosed in the prospectus in a percentage number which is um, stated exactly like this so you have to state it in a percentage the amount of management fees, actually also you do have to mention it in the annual report. If that is the case, I know a lot of research for a quite small thing, but better than not researching stuff. Well, so as a recap, first remember 20% investing maximum in the single usage. Second, 30% net assets invested in other UCIs. So first uh, in a single, then other, 20, 30, and then additional fees, <laughs> additional charges, additional fees for linked UCIs. No. So it's 20, 30 linked UCIs. No. <laughs> Maybe like this, you can just remember it in an easy way. And actually, yeah, well, have in mind <laughs> if you ever need it then if it's more than 50 percent yes you can charge additional fees all right so here's starting again 50 percent or just remember 50 50 percent plus charging everything below no charge all right this is it with the exceptions for open-ended ucis and now because we still have some space left here on the slide, we continue with the exceptions for index replicating <coughs> usage. So again, index replicating usage, I think I mentioned it already, they are existing in two forms. Uh, one time the physical index replicating usage, in the other, <laughs> the other time it is the synthetical index replicating usage, and I think I mentioned it already, what that means. Um, this is not actually always an ETF, so it can, it, there are also existing um, index replicating usage which are mutual funds, for example. I think Fidelity has one, 
actually fidelity world i mean they're often called world i think i've, I've also have it here somewhere on my notes let me see yeah exactly uh, fidelity index world fund is an index tracking mutual fund so an fcp in french or in luxembourgish which is actually french i mean actually luxembourgish is a really interesting language but you speak i mean people do speak also french in luxembourg all right and it can be also a trust i mean it's, it is existing in many forms and ways uh, not only as etfs can also be a trust there's a, a scottish trust i think scottish mortgage investment trust which tries to outperform uh, msci all country world index by the way let's see in two years if that was successful well um <laughs> that just uh, mentioned again for having a better picture of index replicating usage and here we start with the first exception applicable and the first exception actually on, also the the only one so to say the second is only an add-on uh, is that the general rule one is not applicable for these ones what is the general rule one well there was a 10 percent rule so in case it is an index replicating usage shares of that security but shares of that security nothing else in case of a passive usage that is another way to coin it um can be up to 20 percent in special cases even 35 percent all right but what is actually necessary that an index replicating usage can be an index replicating usage in luxembourg which criteria need to be fulfilled actually the CSSF, of course has a has three criteria for recognizing a benchmark as a benchmark that is good enough so to say to be considered yeah a recognized benchmark and therefore it can then be an index replicating usage and the points are the following it needs to be sufficiently diversified representing adequate benchmark and adequate benchmark and published in an appropriate manner and now if someone from ey is actually watching i would like to ask a question because now comes point two and point two deals with the yeah with the definition of these three criteria and it was quite interesting because uh, sufficiently diversified was defined in the book as when number one is given and number one was sufficiently diversified so that is like explaining yellow by saying yeah it's yellow so i don't know i i cannot tell you more than what was standing there maybe i'm wrong um i I've, i don't know what that actually means in the end so we have in mind uh, sufficiently diversified means i mean something is sufficiently recognized as a benchmark by the CSF when it is sufficiently diversified which is defined being sufficiently <laughs> diversified excuse me <clears throat> if you find it out please put it in the comments um all right then it has to be adequate i mean the benchmark and it is um, defined by an index that represents an adequate benchmark is an index whose provider uses a recognized methodology that generally does not result in the exclusion of a major issuer to the markets to which it refers okay that is nothing i have to explain and the appropriate manner is defined by an index that is published in an appropriate manner is an index that is accessible to the public and the provider of which is independent from the index replicating usage of course otherwise it would be a funny situation well that is actually it with the exception for index replicating it's just 
generally just have in mind because I mean like recognized benchmarks are recognized benchmarks and um, they are usually quite known <laughs> and well just remember that it is the first rule which says that general rule one number one not applicable the 10% rule is not applicable but the 20% rule in special cases 35% but just keep in mind 20% uh, in case of index replicate reasons. All right, so we are done with this slide and we can go on to the next. And here we are with the provisional derogations from investment restrictions that is standing behind me. But I tell you that it is standing there and you can trust me, of course, it is standing there. Mm, so now we are dealing with at what time or which circumstances one can waiver the um, investment restrictions given in the general rules, for example. So actually, um, in certain cases, rules 1 to 7 do not need to be followed, and that is the case when exercising subscription rights. And we will have a closer look about subscription rights in a moment, but upfront, or not upfront, I, I, I'm saying that too much now, but what are the rules 1 to 7? Do you know? Did you remember them? Do you remember them? <laughs> well, if not, here they are. Actually, it's the 10% TSMMI, so transferable securities not exceeding 40%. Not the case in OTC FDIs if the first one's applicable or other usage invest. I mean, like, it's the investment is about other usage. Up to 25% special debt security, EU credit institution, 20% fourth rule deposits investments invest in the same body. CP risk, OTC, FDI, and EDM are combined. I mean, like, are to calculate combined. 20% combination of all these, it was four things. Um, deposits, similar structures to TSMIs, TSMIs, and something else and what was it ah, bothers me I don't remember it I just remember 20% combination then you know okay whatever that is there 20% combination seventh not over 35% and this is actually referring to the uh, law 2010 law 43 3 issued by the EU and the eighth is the same group it is considered to be the same group if it is dealing with consolidated accounts. Well, okay, so the first seven rules can be wavered when exercising subscription rights. But um, remedy of any violation, uh, remedy any violation of restrictions as soon as possible, yes. <clears throat> of course, that, I mean, like, they can be wavered in case one I mean the fund is exercising subscription rights but then it has to be as soon as possible corrected so to say of course what is the dero derogation period generally and when is it like applicable this is when I use it uh, when I use it when a fund <clears throat> is launching new, newly formed usage no I, I, because i was wondering is it uci or is it usage no it's usage and um newly formed usage have up to six month dero derogation period in the beginning actually there are of course some um further informations which to find in the CSSF clarification 12, uh, circular, actually circular, I don't know why I put clarification, 12 slash 540. And here it is, the clarification on the period of existing non-launch compartments and compartments awaiting reactivation. And one can see it already that here is 18 months stated, <clears throat> because that's actually the situation um, if um, if it's not launched but it is already 
like is approved exactly that's the word i was looking for it is approved already by the csf but not launched yet so then if, if, in case if that is the case i always want to say in case that's the case um well if that's the case then the compartment has 18 months in case it's a compartment uh, to yeah to launch and this is defined in this wonderful clarification otherwise it is six month that the derogation period is uh, working. Well, the 18 months are not for the derogation period. They are only the time that it has to be launched. And then the six months are um, applicable. So if it starts after 70, I mean, if, it's, if it launches after 17 months, then after 23 months, then... <clears throat> the derogation period is over yeah well of course not when exercising subscription rights anyways and yeah here it is a standing in text form the derogation period starts from the date of the authorization authorization that was the word of the usage or in the case of an umbrella fund <coughs> Of course, the compartment that. However, if the usage has not been launched since its authorization date, the derogation period starts from the date of its first net asset value. This is it in detail. And the usage must communicate the first math date to the CSF and it must occur within 18 months of the authorization date of the usage compartment outlined in point 2 of CSF circular 12540. Uh, at which we've had a look, now, which is a still here, if one still wants to have a look. All right, so now what happens? Uh, now we just have a look at the... Well, I was thinking maybe the headline will appear first, but I think it will appear in the end. So we, <laughs> we're having a look at a CCAF SIF. Uh, which is a hedge fund in this situation and because we want to have a better understanding understanding of the subscription rights i mean when one is exercising subscription rights what does it actually mean well that means in case it is a psychiatrist SIF, a hedge fund in, in that case um, means that there are types of offerings for example because um, subscription rights are of course due to I mean like there's an IPO an initial public offering and that can have different offering forms and this is actually the process of making um, of exercising sub, uh, subscription rights well and these forms I just quickly put them up here so there's the initial public offering as one form uh, actually like yeah the offering has four forms not the IPO has four forms IPO is a way of offering uh, yes <laughs> then we have the private placement which uh, then is of course not public while the IPO is public and is way more it's, it's a way uh, vast it's, it's a vaster pro process so private placements are actually more done with already existing investors, sophisticated investors, which do want to invest into maybe another investment policy or something in another compartment or just in the same compartment. Well, and then, uh, yeah, ah, of course, also, and thereby if that is happening then the subscription rights are applicable also for all the other shareholders so actually if it's even even if it's a private placement that is taking place the other shareholders need to be informed that they can make rights of their subscription rights and that they can make use of their subscription rights because uh, subscription rights for the investors meaning they can buy shares if shares are issued on a discount basis actually 
then up to the double I think they have. Uh, if it's 10%, they can issue again 10%. And that, that is meant by subscription rights, because actually private placement is taking place. Of course, all the other investors need to be informed as well in a manual random. And then they have a period in which they can decide if they want to or not. And well, that is not the only thing. And yeah. And then after a time, this is has taken place, and some more shares are issued. And oh yeah, there are also convertible bonds existing as an offering type that is providing the benefit of a fixed income, like classical bonds. And additionally, also the upside of issuing companies stock in case, of course, um, stock is included. For example, if it's a microfinance um, fund, then <laughs> yeah, it's difficult. There's no stock in it. But then, usually, in case it's a microfinance fund, for example, then usually there is a premium ratio to the NAV. And uh, they're standing also <clears throat> the rules there of like the conversion ratio of these like, convertible bonds, bonds, but, and, and the maturity and all these things, the interest rates they are stated in the prospectus and need to be stated there well convertible bonds bonds are actually a product like bonds but you well, I mean they have the possibility to convert them into shares yeah and thereby they they can have a, they can catch two things so to say if it's with um, if it's like with stocks then they have a fixed income version, so it provides more security thereby. But as well, they can, like in case, for example, stocks are going up, I mean, the stock prices are going up, then they can um, convert the bonds into shares and can benefit therefrom as well. So, but this is, of course, not everything. Actually, this is worth uh, also to a whole, a whole chapter. A whole um, part well but just in, in short and this is actually also to be found in yeah, because I was asking myself okay well so this needs to be laid down in the prospectus and where is actually defined what and how a, a prospectus is organized or structured and what needs to be in and what not and this is to find in the EU directive that I hope, yeah, I have it here, I have it here, uh, regulation, excuse me, not a directive, and 2017 slash 11 level, 11 11, no, 1 1 2 9, I think that's what I wanted to say, and this became actually effective in 2019, and the one before was, I think, from 2003, this new regulation, I've had a yeah, close look to it, uh, is like streamlining the processes a little bit more and try tries to provide a better investor protection and of course many other things um, I will read it somewhere soon then I can tell you more about it and yeah well this is only I'm wondering eh, okay it is still <laughs> so here the headline exercising subscription rights meaning that actually why just as a question from chapter two, like, a, like how was it? Follow up question from chapter two. Why a psychf SIF for a hedge fund? Why incorporating that like that? Well, because the psychf is up to, has more regulatory and reporting issues. And an SIF, specialized investment fund, I think it was, hopefully, um, is actually not part of these things. For example, in an SIF, one is able to short selling. I mean, to to do short selling. That was missing the verb. And in a SIF, this is not possible. So actually, the combination of these two are a really good structure to structure a um, financial vehicle that then can be, for example, a hedge fund. Yeah, because 
it can short sell, it can use FX operation, Forex, and many other advantages. So this also said, we can continue with the next slide. And the next slide, here we are, this time having a look at investment in other compartments. So, yeah, I think there's a, there's a picture even, so I don't have to somehow try to explain it with my hands. So there's the compartment one, and there's the compartment two, and in between, they do want to invest in each other. So at least, let's say, one wants to invest in the other. So compartment one wants to invest in the compartment two. Actually, simultaneously, they are part of the same usage. So what would it mean when one compartment of a usage is investing in another compartment of a usage? Almost destroy my table here. Um, uh, well, this has many benefits also because like, it can the one compartment can diversify thereby its risks. So that's one thing, and would be one thing, and as well, it. Well, for example, it can like if this the other compartment has another investment strategy, it can also take part of that investment strategy. But it cannot do that too much because the compartment one has maybe a different investment strategy. Well, however, it, it is beneficial in some cases, but of course there are exceptions and detailed rules which we are going to have a look at. So, exactly, we do have here investment restrictions. For example, one could also imagine um, they are investing like 100% to the other compartment, thereby it would only mirror the uh, compartment. So let's say, where's my list pointer? Let's say compartment one is the the one that wants to invest in compartment two. In that situation, I mean, in the now by myself created the situation, and so compartment two is the target. All right, which investment restrictions are applicable? Let's have a look. If it wants, yeah, there it is. So the target cannot invest in turn in the compartment invested in. All right, so if one invests in two, so actually this here, of course, it works if this one is only investing in, in this one or compartment one is only investing in this one. But in our situation right now, it, it one invests in two and then two is not able to uh, invest in turn in the other compartment. All right, that's the first thing. The second thing, it has to be below 10% of its assets. So it cannot invest more than 10%. This is like similar to the rule one, generally. Voting rights attaching to the relevant securities are suspended for as long held by the compartment concerned. Well, why that? I think we've had that already in another situation. Sorry, my chair was a little bit Confusing. Um, we had that already in another situation because if the voting rights were not suspended as long held by the compartment concerned, the compartment could, via this operation, influence the, the strategy of the other compartment. For it has then the voting rights and can just decide something that the other compartment maybe would not uh, go for. So therefore, the voting rights are um, suspended for this time. All right, nothing too difficult. What else? We do have some extras also. And, oh, well, this is about the calculation of net assets. Actually, like, if, if one does that, so if one has several, let's imagine, like 30 compartments, a huge umbrella fund, and they are actually, yeah, it's, it's quite huge. There, it's like very huge. And yeah, well, if every compartment 
So then 15 compartments could invest into other 15 compartments, 10%. That is 150% increase if it would be taken into account um, of the net assets, I mean, in the calculation of the net assets. Therefore, that is not, that is prohibited, so to say. And what else was about to say? Uh, what else about that was to say? <laughs> Let's just continue, then I will know. Uh, verify, ah, yeah, well, because, <laughs> yeah, it needs to, I mean, to verify the threshold that is imposed by the 2010 law, and that is 1.25 million for usage. Um, well, this is not taken into account because otherwise it's like cheating. And cheating, at least here, is not working. All right, I think, yeah, is 1 to 5 million. That is considered the minimum threshold of net assets for usage. Well, that is, I think, yeah, that is it already um, in the investment in other compartments. But to remember, like the target cannot invest more than 10% in other uses. Also, I mean, just to remember it, that, that one has an idea of how this whole thing looks like in the end. Yeah, this is actually rule one. And then we have uh, also rule four is, is good to remember here that 20% can be then invested in a single compartment. Generally, now we know, okay, compartments within the same usage can invest at maximum 10%, but generally, of course, 20%. In a single compartment, this is rule four. All right. Oh, yeah. Also, then, I mean, if we are remembering that already, then we can also remember that this needs to be disclosed in the prospectus and details on restrictions that apply need also to be disclosed in the prospectus of course and well if one asks why i mean why in general and um, is that why that is made like this that serves diversification and risk management as well which is like here which is quite clear because diversification and risk management is always belonging, in most of the cases, belonging together. More diversification, of course, differs the risk evaluation, the risk assessment of a portfolio. So that's actually the reason behind all that. And now, yeah, this, is, this was just additionally, just to have it in mind. And I was wondering while I was doing this slide about, so we have the, the usage in general and we have compartments within the usage. So in this year we have two, but let's, let's say we have 10. It doesn't matter how many. There are compartments and there is the usage itself. So actually this is two different objects. So I was wondering like who is actually more investing in usage? And who's more investing in compartments? It's just uh, um, just to, to, to think and to have a better overview of this of, of the situation. Ah. <laughs> and of course, the cat is also here. I think I mentioned it in the last part that maybe there will be another cat appearing. Here it is. All right. So please, anyways, focus on the uh, important things. So who is investing in a usage as a whole? Well, that's retail investors. I mean, it makes more sense that it is retail investors like small businesses or individuals. And for this is a, like the whole usage, of course, is a way more diversified portfolio. And of course, it offers the benefit um, of that it is managed by professional fund managers, which hopefully is a benefit. So this is typically the like segment investing in the usage as a whole. So, and who could be interested in investing in a usage compartment? Well, that is most of the time larger investors like pension funds or insurances, um, something like this. Because, why? Because these investors may have 
like specific requirements for their investments. For example, a pension fund is in, in most of the countries, I guess, um, considered, I mean, like obligated to invest in low risk, I mean, a certain amount of its assets in uh, low risk investments. And therefore, there can like appear requirements. Oh, maybe I should just press it, continue, click on the next thing, um, because there then it is also standing. Well, exactly like insurance companies, large investors for their specific investment needs or requirements. And that brings the benefit of risk. Like, no, sorry. Once back, this means like the requirements can be like, for example, risk tolerance. That could be also something. As, as I said, like, like a pension fund has to invest in low risk in assets. And this can be met better by, by specialized departments. Then there are like specific objectives like uh, asset classes one wants to an investor wants to invest in or a specific sector of an industry or as well avoid exposure to certain securities maybe an investor uh, don't want to be yeah i think like the the, the uh, i don't know exactly but i think the the church the catholic church invests in has has for example like these ethical uh, requirements for their investments so they have to avoid certain securities and the same is of course uh, also applicable for the it's called sukuk uh, funds that's like the arabic version but i'm i'm really not um into that but of course, they also have like some uh, similar restrictions in terms of investing requirements. All right. So to summarize, the reasons for compartments, I mean, that they generally exist, are diversification, asset segregation. This is also for legal protection to investors in case the usage is liquidated. For example, I mean, like, then for the asset segregation, it has not everything is lost, so to say. It has it has segregated parts. Um, different investment objectives, as mentioned, tax efficiency as well, and operational efficiency. Thereby is meant that the different compartments, so to say, can be streamlining the management. For each compartment has an own. I mean, if one imagines the compartments wouldn't be there and different objectives needed to be met within the fund without the compartments, that would be quite a thing depending on the diversification and the, the um, underlying the policies for if they differ in a, in a huge variety, this is kind of a mess <laughs> to, to have a look after these things. So also from an uh, efficiency point. This is to consider. Well, I think yes, there's nothing to to is nothing left to be mentioned. So the investment in other compartments, we also have had a look at. What to remember from that slide? Maybe, okay, two compartments which want to invest in each other while they are part of the same usage, 10%, not in turn, and voting rights. Well, I think that's the, that's the, and I mean, like actually that the, that is not taken into account in terms of calculation is quite clear if one thinks about it. I mean, like if one would come up with the idea, it's good to know that it is not the case, but also with the just common sense, I think it's quite clear that is not a good idea. Um, I mean, depending on one's ethics, but um, it's not a good idea. Well, that's, I think, basically what to remember. And, well, of course, these things here, then all the other things here were additional 
information, especially the cat. All right, so we can continue with the next slide. Actually, the next <laughs> part was not worth uh, creating a slide, so I will just talk about it that way. And the next, because we know it already also, the next um, thing was like the concerning the mouse of feeder situation. And actually, I remember that in the very beginning, I mentioned already that the master feeder, I mean, the feeder firstly, the feeder fund must invest at least 85% of its assets or units um, to the master fund. And actually, that means like the feeder cannot invest in anything else but the master. I mean, like the 15% left is 15%. That is something, but it is not 85%. So then secondly, the feeder fund is allowed to hold up to 15% of the assets, of course, in a few other types of assets. And these include things like cash, so liquid, really liquid assets, and like financial derivatives for hedging purposes, for example. I mean, this is actually made for, yeah, hedging purposes, like, and <laughs> like these 15%, are for for liquidity reasons and maybe also uh, certain types of property well in case the feeder is an investment company of course and the third thing to mention is that well that these rules are I mean, no that there are rules also for the for the master fund for example the master fund must have at least one feeder fund among its investors, otherwise it cannot be a master fund, but it cannot be a feeder fund itself. I think also we covered that already, and additionally, the master fund cannot hold units of the feeder fund. Sure, makes sense. It would be something completely useless. And, yeah, well, actually, these rules are only designed to make the master feeder structure a master feeder structure and not something else so because that was not worth creating a slide i just uh, mentioned it now like this and here we are with the next slide rules for investment ah, here's an s too much so before it's one too less now it's one too much so please again just imagine this s would not exist and um, investment limits for uses well, so what are the rules for investment limits and what is meant thereby? Well, thereby is meant like the amount that a usage is possible to influence other entities, like its management company, for example. Maybe I should also remember to press the buttons here. Um, yeah, well, and the rule is number one that it cannot buy shares that allows a significant influence over the management company investing in it and that is for good reasons because that would be completely useless i mean like maybe in some very uh, critical situations between the two it would be useful for one of the parties but generally we don't expect situations to be so huge up so um well it makes sense because, I mean, of course it makes sense. I, I don't even know why I have to explain it. Uh, the second point is now a clarification of these, of the limits of a usage regarding this issue. And it says 10% of the non-voting shares of the same issuer. 10% of debt securities of the same, I mean, it's always the same issue. It's about the same issue right here right now. So 25% uh, of the shares or units of the same UCI and 10% of the MMIs issued by the same issuer. Well, that is the details. I guess everyone will forget that. Anyways, anyways, I mentioned it. So actually, yeah, well, it, this is this is a situation. I mean, the whole book is a very <laughs> specific situation. I mean, it deals with specific situations, 
but maybe if one hear it once, then one hear it once, and then if something similar comes up, one remembers ah, there was this situation, and then the one knows where to look. Actually, <laughs> well, of course there are exemptions, exceptions, and one and two. So these two things here are not applicable, which is also really easy to grasp is when the securities are issued or guaranteed by a EU member state or certain international bodies. And then of course also when the management company is only in, a, in the capital of the subsidiary, where subsidiaries are based in the country and they're in the capital, for example. And um, they only do carry out like marketing, management advice, you know, business of management advice or marketing. These three things, which of course also makes absolutely sense, would be completely useless if that was not not applicable. Well, Yeah, I think that's it. I don't have to say much more about it. This is quite clear. I hope. Otherwise, I would ask other questions, but there are no questions. So we can actually continue with the next slide. What is it about? Ah, the next slide is, I think, the last one before we are having a closer look into borrowings, borrowing rules and specifications about uh, short selling as well so but first of course we need to have a look at the next slide so we do that here i'm back as a slide no of course i'm not a slide but uh, since the next issue was also uh, mentioned already and it's not too complicated and i'm not saying that because i'm lazy of uh, creating uh, slides but because to vary the format to keep my uh, audience entertained, of course, that's the reason. No, actually, because we really mentioned that already, and one will remember it, hopefully, where we sat, because this is actually about, uh, I think I mentioned it already, uh, borrowing, lending, and short selling for usage. So, the general rule is, and is already known, that there is no borrowing for usage, and nobody on behalf of a usage is allowed to borrow um, neither the depository neither the management company um, may borrow for the common fund well that is clear when it is generally forbidden then of course also nobody else on behalf is allowed to do so um, but there are of course exceptions to this rule and that is that up to 10% of net assets may be borrowed on a temporary basis only, so not constantly, and up to 10% of net assets in the case of an investment company may be borrowed to acquire property, essential for the business, of course, and the combined amount of such borrowings may in total not exceed 50%, so various combinations are imaginable and possible and also that we, we we've had already uh, once before but it's always good to repeat stuff to memorize it well exactly so do not exceed 15 percent in total of these two things and well yeah a usage also may borrow up to 10 percent of its net assets on a temporary basis, either to meet redemptions or investment purposes under certain conditions. Yes. And well, granting of loans or acting as a grantor, how is it? Grantor? Grantor? Um, on behalf of a third party, of third parties, is not permitted, but acquiring transferable securities that are not fully paid, that is allowed for example, and this then is not to be considered as borrowing. And finally, I think, 
Yeah, uh, there's also to mention that short selling, of course, is not, as mentioned already before, uh, allowed. And oh well, and of course, one is able to use FDIs to synthetically create um, a short position. Yeah, actually, that's it. This is it about the borrowing and lending criteria and somewhere some when some when in the in the lectures before I mentioned that already but actually me I forgot it also it's because I'm so sometimes putting stuff additionally on it well let's hope we are not done already with the book at chapter seven or something because I did that all right um, Ah, yeah, actually, now this is already the end of the video because the next topic is upcoming, so to say, as next, and that is quite large. It's not the next topic, but it's the next, like, bigger thing in the, um, yeah, this chapter. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's quite nice, it's quite long, and even after this chapter, we do have some more. So, it won't get boring. Um, yeah, we will even come to venture capital VCIs in the end. But, well, I will check now if uh, everything, because many things I was just seeing right now uh, were mentioned already. So, then maybe we can just cut it a little bit. So, I hope this was. Um, <sighs> insightful, useful, and uh, as always, I hope it was also enjoyable a little bit, at least. So, yeah, that's it with this presentation, and then see you in the next one.